you know, what what we really uh, wanted to do today was to get Bert Lowenfeld, the person, and not so much the educator, but maybe, and, you know, kind of go back and take a look at when you came to the U.S. and how you found things, and maybe even before then, back when you were in Europe, because I think that's, it's important to me, and I know it is to Phil, and I think it would be to uh, the rest of the field if they could have some idea of how you came to to be where you were as far as at, in New York, and then came to California, yeah. and then... You know, in, 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 what was it, late August, you celebrated your 50th anniversary of... Oh. Our arrival, our arrival in the United States. Well, our, our arrival in 1938 for good, mm -hmm. because in 1930, uh, in September, we arrived for a year. But you know it's different when you arrive in a new country uh, for, and know you will be here for a year and then you go back. Right. And I had to go back because I had a position in Vienna that, that I enjoyed and where I thought I would like to work. But uh, it turned out differently. But in that sense, my coming to the United States for a year is, was entirely different from coming in 1938 when we knew it would be for good. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 1930, it happened this way. I was a, I took, I got my PhD in 1927 and after that attended the seminars at the university in uh, the psychological seminar under Dr. Karl Bühler and Charlotte Bühler, his wife, and uh, I was a member of the group. And uh, so in, 1930, in 1928, a Rockefeller Research Fellowship in the Social Sciences became available. That means two of these became available because the two previous uh, holders uh, had finished their, their two years each. So Dr. Bühler asked me whether I would be interested in coming, in going to the United States because he thought I could very well uh, absorb here what goes on in child psychology, which was my academic field of study, and also in working with the blind, and, and what, uh, in education of the blind in the United States. And he said, when you, when you come back then to Austria, you could tell us and incorporate some of the ideas that you picked up overseas. And I said, I would certainly be interested in it. <coughs> and uh, so he took the necessary steps and uh, the office of the Rockefeller Foundation was in uh, Paris and uh, wrote to them and they af and after that they approved it. They gave, they said I could come to the United States for a whole year and they would uh, give me the stipend that was usual in such cases, including also travel expenses. And that was that. So you it, came over on the ship? Well, I ship? came over in 1930, because in 1929, uh, one of the positions that were vacant were, was filled. And uh, they told me that I would have to wait until 1930. Well, in the meantime, Gretel and I became very close, and we wanted to marry. But one condition of the Rockefeller Fellowship is that you cannot change your status while you are a fellow. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so I had, <coughs> I went to Dr. Bühler and Dr. Chibram, who was uh, the representative of the Rockefeller Foundation, and I told him that uh, it was not of my making that they had to, to postpone it, and whether the Rockefeller Foundation would make an exception and uh, approve it, that I marry, get married, and I would uh, promise them that it would not put any financial obligation on the Rockefeller Foundation because Gretel's father was willing to defray the expenses of Gretel. So uh, 
they said we, they will try and got in touch with Paris and for a couple of weeks I didn't hear anything and then I got and that was uh, a typically American gesture, American to us for, of the good that is in America because we got a telegram that said congratulations, uh, enjoy your year in America. Mm -hmm. Not, no, not a, an official document, <laughs> you are appointed or the Rockefeller the Foundation has considered your application and the application as an exception has been approved and, and things of that kind. But simply congratulations, enjoy your year in America. So that was a very informal but very uh, typically American, we thought, reaction to it. Well, that's the way we came. So uh, it became a, a, a year-long honeymoon. That's what it was, essentially. Mm -hmm. Although I must say it influenced me greatly. I mean, I, I did what I wanted to do. I stayed in New York first, and I had made up my mind on what to do. I thought that the best thing I could do is first study the magazines and journals in the field so that over the last few years, so that I would become acquainted with the trends and also with the personalities. And then <coughs> visit some schools. Perkins I wanted to visit, I visited Baltimore, the, I visited the school, Maryland School for the Blind, I visited Overbrook, and uh, with great of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we, decided that we would like to go also and see the West. And the Rockefeller Foundation uh, appro approved it. So we traveled westward in May. And on the way we stopped over in Illinois, at the Illinois School for the Blind. And there I became more closely acquainted with Catherine Maxfield. Well, she because was she Illinois. was also summer school teaching. Oh. She was summer school teaching at the Illinois School for the Blind, had a summer session on, on the campus mm. for the staff. Uh, <coughs> that's where most of the training took place at that time, wasn't it? Pardon? That's where most of the in-service training or training of the Usually teachers? on the campus, if a school was progressive enough to have any in-service training. Of yes. course, Perkins Institute has the Harvard course, right. and the New York Institute at that time I don't think the New York in yeah the New York Institute had a similar arrangement uh, that also gave them a uh, college connection. I think it was with Teachers College, but I may be mistaken on that. Uh, the the in Illinois we stayed for I think it was two or three weeks, two weeks, and uh, Catherine Maxfield and then some other people. Uh, who are now not really very actively remembered anymore in our field, but the Frida Kiefer Mary, you may remember oh, yes. her. She wrote on Braille. Wrote on Braille <coughs> and wrote on a number of other things. And her husband wrote a book on the education of blind children. Hmm. And uh, so they were also there. Hmm. So we had quite an interesting summer session and uh, Mr. Wool, Wool, what was the name of the superintendent? It will come back to me. Uh, and his wife were charming guests, guests, uh, charming hosts. And we, we stayed and uh, we enjoyed the visit. And then we went further west by bus, which was, of course, very uh, tedious for the first uh, 36 hours, I would say. Between Chicago and Denver, you have nothing but flat country, and that may be very important from an agricultural point of view, but that from the point of view of a foreigner <laughs> who wants to see a variety of things, it's interesting. It was, uh, it taught me something. It taught me how big this country was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you don't have the idea how big it is when you stay, or, well, fly at that time there was no flying of course 
in 1950. And when you contrast it with Europe, where you oh, can go through yeah. four countries in a day easily, yeah. And <coughs> so we came, we came to, to California, and Dr. French, who had invited us to stay at the California School for the Blind at that time, which we did, it was vacation time. So we were, we were more or less the only ones who lived mm. on the campus. And Dr. French and Dean Kemp, who was the dean of the School of Education at UC, took us to, uh, to Asiloma. Uh -oh. And Dr. Kemp said, you must come to Asiloma whether I, uh, even if I have to take you myself. So French couldn't come, so Kemp took us there. And we stayed, and he stayed with us for two days, and then he left, but he had told us we would want to stay a little longer. So we had brought our baggage along, mm. and we stayed for almost a week. At that time, it was, it, Carmel was small, it was a small hamlet almost, and uh, we walked from Asilomar, we walked through the dunes to uh, the pier there, Fisherman's Wharf, yes, see, so we stayed at Fisherman's Wharf, uh, and we, we ate at Fisherman's Wharf, and when Dean Kemp, uh, Dean Kemp made us acquainted with Pop Ernest, who was the guy who uh, invented practically the, uh, no, what was it called, Avalone. Oh. You know, he was the <coughs> one who found that you can serve abalone like they served Wiener Schnitzel. Pound it to death. Pound it, yes, otherwise pound it. It's and inedible. Otherwise, <laughs> it's, yes. Pound it and then break it, mm -hmm. like a Wiener Schnitzel, veal cutlet. Well, uh, we met Dean Pop, Pop Ernest. We met Pop Ernest, and he came to our table. He knew Dean Kemp, and we had and he immediately started telling us he comes from Munich and, and so on, you know, and, and, and spoke German. Well, after that, we went back to Berkeley and then we returned to the East and by that time we were ready to go back to Vienna. When we came <coughs> back to Vienna, everything seemed so narrow, dark, and, and uh, we felt hemmed in, you know. It was the the Street width largeness of this yes. country, and the the, uh, the the largeness of the field of education of the blind and of child psychology. That you where you have so many varieties uh, of approaches here at the, at the different universities. I was at, uh, te at Teachers College, Columbia University. I became a member of their of their seminar, and uh, I met all the big shots there, and uh, in, in, in uh, Baltimore and in various other places I had contacts also, and in the field of the blind, the education of the blind, there were, uh, it was so impressive, but in Vienna, in Austria, you had two or three schools for the blind, that was all, and they were small schools, mm -hmm. I mean the school. Uh, our school, uh, the school where I was teaching had about 50 children. The largest school in Vienna had about 150. So uh, it, uh, it's all, it was uh, comparing on a small scale and on, a, on a, an oppressively small scale. Now, 1930, though, was still the height of the Depression in the United States. Yes. Did you see any evidence of that? Oh, yes. We saw the bread line. Mm -hmm. We saw the apple sellers. Five cents per apple, a nickel, and. Uh, but even with that image of the United States, it still seemed like the place to be. Yeah, okay. it it was. I mean, to us, it was. Of course, we did not. We were uh, out of competition because yeah. I, I knew I had to return to Austria, so it wasn't a point uh, where we would we would have creating any feelings that here is a man who might take my place, right? you know. Uh, so naturally that gave us a certain amount of, yeah. of neutrality in that respect. It but it was an enriching right? year, it was a very enriching year. And we did not 
fathom, not even think of the possibility how important it might one day become. Although I made efforts to come back, I wrote to uh, Marjorie Hooper's father, oh. and I wrote to Dr. French, and French was at that time the director of the School for the Blind here, right? and uh, Dr. French wrote me as much as he would like me on this time. But there are lots of teachers in California who cannot find jobs, and uh, he cannot engage somebody who is not a citizen and who is not a, uh, is not uh, has not residence in California. That was mm -hmm. impossible for him. <coughs> uh, Perkins was was interested, but they were all interested, but they but none of them had a job. So seven years went by the Seven years went winter. by, and then we didn't have, I mean, uh, and then it was, it was a necessity for us. What, what were those seven years like? I know you were with an orphanage for a while. Yes, I was with them <coughs> for a while. I thought, I thought that no matter what would turn out, uh, in what way it would turn out, because I wanted to stay in work with the blind, uh, getting away from it for a while and working with uh, normal children would be, a, would be a plus. And also I could get administrative experience, so I became the head of, a, of what was a, an orphanage, but was changed into a home for children. Not only orphan children, but also other children where parents were divorced or where uh, parents... Uh, Wards of the state? Yeah. 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 For, well, for different reasons, not in a position right. to take care of their child. So, and, and that, uh, and Gretel uh, became, in ch came, got, uh, was in charge of the, of the kitchen and uh, physical facilities. And we worked together, I was the shooting, I was the director, Gretel was the, uh, in charge of the kitchen arrangement and the plant. The plant Did that was was Spanish. Was Vienna a um, a glamorous city in the 30s? Well, it was recovering from a depression. Mm. See, so the depression, the depression in Europe, too. In Europe yeah. started before it mm. started in America. It then spread to, you, to the um, United States because the banking, actually it started to a large extent in Vienna mm. because the largest bank in Vienna, uh, in Austria, uh, folded up. Mm. So that and this, this the was the, this effect, was the, yeah, right? this was a domino effect. That's right. I mean, other European banks fell, and other, uh, and that had its effect on the United States and on the Scandinavian countries, in which my father-in-law was interested because he had an export business from Vienna to the. Scandinavian countries. So this was uh, in, in 1930, 31 was a time when the when Austria was in a depression also. So during the 30s, there, there was re that was really kind of a recovery time. Yeah. And about the time that Hitler right. made his move, the the country still was not strong then. Well, Hitler made his move in Germany in 1933. He became uh, the, the Führer of Germany, the Chancellor. And uh, in Austria, we had a very strongly, uh, we had a theocracy in a way. The Austrian government was a Catholic government and ruled the whole country. Hmm. You had to be a member of this organization of the state organization and the state organization was Catholic. So uh, the, the uh, labor was suppressed. So, so Austria had a national religion? I didn't yes. know that. Yeah. Do they still? Yes. Austria had uh, uh, the state religion was Catholic. Is that part of the Hohenzollern uh, Empire? No, no, the no. Hohenzollern was German. But uh, Austria, Gee, at that, that time, Austria had a, <laughs> had a, you know, Dolfus, if the name says anything to you. It was a, a, a chancellor, an Austrian chancellor, who was killed by Nazis. Mm. And that started the turn toward 
Catholicism because uh, it was the, the Catholics were the strongest party. Mm. Besides the dem social democrats, the Marxist party, and they folded up. So at that time, the years from 1931 to 1938, years were the preparatory years for Nazism. So how tough was it for you and Gretel to leave? Well, compared with others, it wasn't really very tough. The tough thing was that we had to liquidate our existence in Austria. Mm. And uh, it's a different thing when you do it on your own and on your own will than if you are doing it under the uh, pressure and dominance of a regime that is dictatorial. See? And uh, of course then in uh, March 1938 uh, Hitler came to Austria and from then on uh, everybody knew, everyone who was Jewish knew that he had to go. That it was either leaving or staying in or perish. Yeah. So you arrived in New York in August of 38. We arrived in September 38. September 38. Yeah. So from Early March from, March from March until August we were under Hitler in Austria. Yeah. Hmm. And I was still in charge of that uh, home for the children. And I came pretty close a few times to being uh, taken away, but for some reason, uh, once, for instance, the fact that I was born and raised in Linz, which was the hometown of Hitler, mm. saved me, because the man already took, had taken me into custody. Mm. And when when I told, when he asked me where I, where I uh, mm. was born and raised, and they said in Linz, it gave him a kind of a shock. He was not too educated a man. And he uh, asked me whether I have other people who work at this home. And I said, yes, sure, everybody has to work when you are with children. And I could see his mind working. You know. And uh, yeah, he asked me where I was going. And I said, I have to go to the parliament. and." Uh, get permission and checks to run the home because it was all centralized there under the Nazis. And he said, you have to go to the parliament, you know, with this kind of... His initial question was, are you Jewish, of course? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And uh, then he took me and asked me this, these questions and uh, when it came to the point where I had to tell him that I was born and raised in Linz. And then he started questioning for a way out because I said I have an appointment in the, in the office there in, in the parliament. And uh, then he said, he looked me over from head to toe and said, we'll get you if we want to. Mm. And mm. That, that and it pushed me away. Mm. And I was glad to be away and, and, and could go back. Every experience like that must have made it uh, all the more important to leave. Well, uh, there was no question about that in mm -hmm. nobody's mind. When when did you have the first idea that you you know you when when Hitler came into Austria, then you knew that there was no alternative. I knew there was no, no, there was no alternative. alternative. You there was no alternative, and and. Catherine <coughs> Maxfield sent me the papers and another friend whom we made in 1930-31 in New York sent me also papers. So I had two papers, two affidavits as they were called, and we could, we, I, I immediately get, got in touch with the American consulate in Vienna and I had appointments scheduled there. And it, it took, I mean you stayed you you lined up there at four o'clock in the morning in order to be seen sometime on During the next the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah. Whatever they get. Yeah. 
and uh, that's what we what I had to do. But that that was my, these were minor inconveniences. If it meant the ultimate getting out and saving sure. your hide, then. yeah. And then we went from from Vienna to Czechoslovakia because Gretel's sister lived in Czechoslovakia, and uh, we wanted to spend to unwind there rather than go directly to the United States. So you traveled by ship twice yeah, from we Europe. By ship. Do you get seasick? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got seasick, but I got seasick. We, we flew from Prague mm. to Amsterdam, to Am Amsterdam. And, uh, and I was so seasick, air sick. Oh, really? <gasps> I was asking for years. I always took when I had to fly uh, to fly for the American Foundation for the plan. Later on, I always took uh, drama uh, mean pill yes. until one day I forgot it and I didn't get sick. <laughs> <laughs> so from then on, I gave it up. But the the memory of the way I arrived in Amsterdam, I had to be carried out horizontally. Mm. I couldn't walk mm. and well. Uh, of course, it was the after effect of Hitler, too. Sure. Uh, and I, uh, I mean, I was under a lot in very good shape. What well, even flying to Amsterdam, though, hadn't Hitler already taken over Holland? No, not Holland. No, 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 no. no. In, in, uh, this was in uh, the fall of 1938. Czechoslovakia was free. Oh, really? So Holland ah. was, of course, free. That came, uh, that 39. came later, in yeah. 39. But, uh, when we arrived in Holland, I had a cousin who lived in Amsterdam, and he picked us up at the at Schiphol Airport, and I had to be taken out horizontally, and went to with him, and then Gretel's brother came and met us in Antwerp, because that's where we took the boat, mm. and uh, from there, on, from then on, we went on. Uh, um, a Dutch boat which was called Western Land and we went ten days it took us from Holland mm. to New York. Do you remember seeing the Statue of Liberty? Oh yeah, uh, that I remember very vividly. <laughs> was that a welcome sight? I can tell you. That lady was really welcome. Mm. Did you have to go to Ellis Island? No. Yeah. No. No, no. We arrived, we had our immigration papers mm. in good order. There was no no oh, question. Yeah, and then uh, I got the day after I arrived, I got in touch with the other gentleman who uh, sent us a paper, sent us papers in New Jersey, an attorney, and uh, wanted him to write them for Victor and his wife and for Hansel. Mm -hmm. His his son was like seven or eight years old at that time. And he immediately agreed to do that. He said mm -hmm. it would be an honor and so on. Very nice, uh, very nice man who had written us letters in a rather, how shall I say, rather uh, elevated, uh, religiously almost, mm -hmm. religiously elevated style. And I thought he must be an old Jew, mm -hmm. you know, because he wrote in such a way that I would, would have thought he is. He's probably very religious and writes that way. And when we came to his office in, in uh, New Jersey, an elegant office, modern, and we saw the secretary first, and she said, I will tell Mr. Hess right away. And uh, we expected a bearded man to come out. Out comes a very handsome, young-looking man and he em embraced us both and was a very, very uh, elegant and very, uh, above all, a very kind-hearted man. So he, he had taken it on himself to try to, to, try to get, get as many update. people out. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Catherine Maxfield had, in oh. had intervened with him. So he was responsible then for helping Victor and his family. Yeah. Home. yeah. When did they arrive? They arrived in December. But that was already a different thing. Victor couldn't take anything with him. Hmm. You see, because it, 
in, in November was the day when one of the Jewish men shot, shot a German in Paris. And from then on, the Kristallnacht, the night where all synagogues were destroyed uh, in Germany and where the uh, whole thing became extreme. You know, where anti so he, he became is, they just got extreme. out with their yeah. clothes and, what and they, they were got wearing. out with what they had on their on their bodies, yeah. practically nothing. Else. Hmm. But Victor had in, had published his book in London, in England. It was translated and was published in English already. So when he came to London, he went to his publisher Routledge, and uh, they gave him a check in advance so that he didn't arrive without anything in the United States. We could take out $24, straight like that, between the two of us, <coughs> for all the money we could take out. So Creative and Metal Growth, is that the book he published No, first that in was the nature of Creative Activity. Oh. Creative and Mental Growth he published here. But the nature of Creative Activity is his first book. Oh. No, his second book. That was published in England. Where did your brother live at that time in Austria? In Vienna. In Vienna. Yeah. In Vienna. Oh, we saw each other quite often. Then. So, at this point, do you consider? Wh are you in a? Uh, what do you consider your nationality? Mine. Yeah. You're an American. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. The Austrian part is oh, years that, ago. Oh, that <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah. that is. Oh, of course, everyone has his uh, memory of his youth, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I can't, I mean, uh, nobody can divorce himself from that, even if he wanted to, but I don't want to. No. I mean, I, um, here, look at the books. I mean, and and that, when I go to Europe, you tell up. me where to go in Austria, which is so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pete, well, Pete and Ina are going to go to Europe next summer. You'll have to tell them where Oh, you are visit. going together? Well, we'll meet over there, no, yes. He'll be yeah. there before us, and then we'll I catch see. up to him. That's very nice. Yeah. So well, you have been in Europe Australia. before? I have not. No. No. You I have been in Australia, though. Well, I'm going in November 3rd for seven weeks. Oh. I'm going to teach down there. To Australia, month. teach yeah. there. Good. Yeah. But you know Australia. Okay. I was there you during there. service. You were there. Yeah. yeah, 47 years ago, so yeah. it's a long yeah, time long ago. Yeah, a long time ago. It's much different than it was. You know, most of the Australian men were up fighting in Tobruk, up yeah. in North Africa, yeah, sure. and, and New Guinea, and uh, during the World War. Right. Yeah. When, when you and Gradle have returned over the years, uh, every once in a while to Europe, what has it meant to you to go back? Has it been to see the scenery, to kind of reconfirm your roots? No. Uh, not really. I, I think it's more to delve into the European air, mm. the atmosphere, you know. I understand that. Yeah, you uh, understand I've that. Experience yeah, it's a that. different. Yeah. It's a different atmosphere. Uh, and and uh, of course it is also influenced by the fact that we both spent our young days in Europe. And, uh, we are influenced, of course, by the culture that surrounded us. You introduced me to Europe, and I think that much of my appreciation for Europe is because I had you the first time well, I went. <laughs> it was fun for you. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, well, but it, it's, it's a different atmosphere. I mean, the, the, the simple fact that uh, things have grown there for hundreds of years, that the old Greek culture, the Roman culture, and then everything that uh, existed since then in Europe uh, gives it a, an aura that uh, can hardly be duplicated. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, that the Britishers, for instance, why do they go back to their home country all the time? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not because it is so beautiful, because in most parts of England it is really beautiful. Uh, but uh, there is an atmosphere there that uh, is, is uh, attractive and, and means something. But in, in 1938, when we came here for good, 
uh, I settled, we settled first in New York, as most of the people who came from Europe as refugees uh, did. I had the great advantage that I was trained in a field that uh, was looking for academically oriented people at that time. There were not, there were, I think, Catherine Maxfield was one of the few PhDs. There were probably, besides her, I don't know. Dr. French. Yeah, Dr. French had his PhD. Yeah, I was trying to think just yeah. now, who else in that era had yeah, a doctorate? About, uh, had an earned doctorate, yeah. you know. How about Warren Bledsoe's father? Was he at no, the Maryland School? No, no. He was, he was superintendent of the Maryland School, but he was not academically. Uh, he was, had his professional training, but he right. didn't have a, a, a PhD degree. So at that time, um, I mean, I was lucky, and I was also at, somehow at the right age, because I had absorbed the European uh, way of doing things in our field, and I was still young enough. In 1938, I was 37 years old. I was still young enough to adjust and to to make the American ways my own. So that was an advantage <coughs> that I had. Let me backtrack for a minute. When you saw the schools for the blind in the United States in 1930, how did they compare to European schools? Oh, luxurious. Really? Yes. Luxurious by comparison. Hmm and large, much larger than most of the European schools are. There are not many schools in Europe that have more than 200 students, while in the United States there were quite a few of them. And they were only state schools, while in Europe they were federal schools in most mm. uh, other respects. So, and the many smaller states like Holland, Sweden, I mean the School for the Blind in Sweden, in, in Holland, are the smallest schools, under 100 children, including and some of them under 50 children. In terms of education, were, was the United States doing well? Or yeah, uh, the United States was doing very well. The United States was doing very well, and uh, comparatively, as I said, luxurious because, you know, in a small school, uh, how much variety of education and educational uh, environment, how much of it can they offer? Mm -hmm. If they have 50 children, 70 children, yeah. 100 children, which were already larger schools in Europe. But they can't offer, I mean, they, they cannot possibly offer anything like a complete high school curriculum. What were the staff, were there <coughs> quite a few visually impaired teachers on the staffs of the... Of most schools in the United States, yeah. yes. How about in yes. Europe? In Europe also, yeah, we had the same, the same way. It was probably not very much different in that respect, because all the schools uh, wanted to give their graduates a chance, and uh, did quite well by doing so. In 1930, that that was a period of time before Braille was officially adopted in the United yes. States. Had it been adopted in Europe? Braille? Uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes. So, sure, there was a, a shorthand Braille in German, grade two. So the, 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 um, the, the uh, discussions between New York Point and Braille... We are not moot. That was yeah. moot. There was no, no discussion. I mean, Braille was the generally accepted uh, medium of reading for the blind. Of course, the parish school opened that way for Braille. You know. Thinking in terms of Pete, um, what kind of mobility instruction was offered in the schools in Europe in the 30s? None. None. No, neither did we have any here. I know. <laughs> was it was a one blind student teaching another what to do? Or the one with the most no, vision took the, the other. the general idea was that since they had learned to walk, they will learn to get around. You know. So with a few knots. And yeah, a, yeah. A few, with a few, a few 
blisters and a few bangs uh, on the head. Bangs on the head. Yes, you you they had to get along. And in most cases, they learned some kind of mo mobility. It was not a systematized thing at all, but uh, by necessity, right? They had to learn it. And some of them did quite well, and others did not so well. The individual differences did not disappear, not even with the with all mobility training that we have, that we have here now. Do individual differences disappear? We still have them. Now, next spring, I think in May, you'll celebrate your 40th anniversary of being in California. Is that right? In May 1989, 49. 49. We came in May 49, right. Which means yeah. that of the 50 years in the United States, 10 were spent in New York. New York, right. And 40 in 40 in, 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 in California. Yeah. Yeah. In California, I'm already longer here in California than I was anywhere else. Longer in California than most people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is a natural I have concomitant of getting old, you know? <laughs> I have you beat. Yeah. <laughs> I've been here longer. You have been longer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sure. No, I mean, but when, uh, when I think I, li I lived in Austria, uh, 38 years. But here I live already for so 40, 40 years. years. In, in those early days in, in Europe, did they, did the various countries get together, those people interested in education for the blind, did they have any kind of conferences or? No, uh, there, was, there was something that was called the European Congress of Educators of the Blind that was founded in 1873 already. And it was founded in the school in which I was a teacher by the superintendent who was then in charge of the school. So it's over 100 and years old. Right? Uh, pardon me? It's 100 years old or yes, more, right? Yes, 1873, you see. Right. I, I wrote an article about that. It, it's in the, it was published in the journal. Mm. 100 years uh, <coughs> jubilee of uh, education of the blind in Europe. And the school for the blind, of the, Vienna, in which I was teaching, Hohe Warte, it was called, which means the high lookout point, uh, was a uh, was the school that called this conference. In 1873, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> right. You, you were not there. You can be sure of that. <laughs> but, uh, the, but besides that, this Congress that had, did not really have a great lasting influence. It was the first time that teachers internationally got together. But uh, and there were European Congresses, not regularly as we have them now, and, uh, but important were the German Congress of German Teachers of the Blind. Austria was really not very important because it was a small country and it, it was in a way influenced by Germany a great deal. Mm -hmm. So the, con the German teachers, the Austrian teachers tended to attend the German teachers' congresses. Also because there were larger and a greater variety of programs in the programs to offer. But uh, each country, French teachers, Spanish teachers had their own uh, organizations in their own meetings. Why? And the language plays a role. Right. Yeah. Why do you think it is that um, in Germany and Austria in particular, changes to integrated programs for blind children has been so slow? I think the main reason is that the schools for the blind were so firmly established mm -hmm. and there was no thought given to the kind of uh, public school placement that became gradually accepted here in the United States. You see, that came only under the influence of the United States mm -hmm. that the Europeans changed their mind. Yeah. 
That's interesting. Um, I, I find that uh, the, the, my German colleagues still have a very strong belief that, um, that the, the local public schools in Germany are simply not organized uh, in such a way as to accommodate blind students. Well, I would say they are <coughs> organized for it, but the teachers of the blind don't believe in them. Yeah. I think that's the main, the most important. They are so, uh, I mean, their, their, their bias is so strong in favor of residential schools. And in a way that has something to do with the fact that uh, residential schools in England were common and were the preferred way of education. Mm -hmm. You see, in, in from England that spread into the European mm -hmm. uh, countries, into the continental countries too, and uh, in a way they have not yet overcome this uh, prejudice. England is changing very dramatically. England right is now. changing more uh, more quickly than the continental yes. countries are. Tell me something. Do you remember the first time you met Pete? The first time I met Pete? Yeah. It was in New York when we had a course for VA personnel, wasn't it, with Pete? Might have been, right? Yeah. I yeah. think I remember you as a young man at that time. Uh, that's so far as my memory goes. Then the next time was when you wanted me to come up and, and give you and a hand. Give, give me a hand in the mobility, uh, mobility program. Right. I was working at yes. the orientation center. That's right. And I, and I looked for someone who would know something right. uh, because I knew hardly anything at that time. Some very, very good young men and ladies to work with. Right. Carlos yeah. Ortiz. Yes, Ortiz. And, and John, I'm trying to think. Uh, John Cavanaugh. Right. Yeah. The, these, this, uh, this is the... Was Ray Lemus up there too? Ray Lemus was there Yes, too. Yes, sure. Ray Lemus. Yeah, quite, we had quite a good group at that time. It, was it you and Charlie Buell? No, I just no. came up a couple of days, a couple afternoons a week, and worked probably from 1.30 or so till... Because hmm. I had to get the students after they got out of school. Yeah. As I remember. Yeah. Right. Out right. of the, and it, and, and <coughs> you will was not very enthusiastic about it. No. Was there, um, the, the, was that the time when you were working with the daughter of, whose parents owned the stationery store on College Avenue? Yeah, I remember that. Uh, or was that, that, that came later? a little later. Later, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Because she went to public school. Yes. So you worked with her when she was in public yes. school. Yeah, but I remember that very... But didn't you attend a, a VA arranged, the Veterans Administration arranged a course for rehabilitation teachers? I, I was at Heinz, but I did not go to that one. Larry Blaha and Stan Saturko and they, John Malabasin. They went. In. Yes. Yeah. I thought you were with that. No. I, I just came on board so they didn't think I had enough. You had enough pre-training. Right, enough yeah. knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. No, then, 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 then it was the first time when I asked yeah. for your assistance uh, right. here. Right. Mm -hmm. Berkeley. Right, and then, and then you and wanted, then you and Dan, John Dan Johnson wanted me to go to Alameda and you wanted me to come to school for the blind, right? right? Yes, I did. Oh, I didn't I know did. that. Yes. yes. Uh, he had an offer to come to the yes. school for the huh. yeah. So in 1938, you went to work where? Uh, I went, uh, when I came to New York, I went to work first for the New York Institute for the Education of the Blind. Out on Pelham Park. Uh, Park. Pelham Park, right. right. And Gretel and I, we got ourselves an apartment uh, near Pelham Park, right, because uh, Dr. Fant had offered us both position at the lowest minimum salary that uh, could, find, right? could, could keep us 
out of uh, out of hunger mm. and uh, so I like that area of there, don't you? it's very nice it very was nice very nice there. and the school was a was a well every I wouldn't say it was a good school but it was a, a kind of a luxurious by European concepts a school the school grounds were right. luxurious a lot of room for New York City, right? Yeah, yes, yes, a lot of room for New York City on Pelham yes. Parkway. But uh, the school was <coughs> was by no means a well-run school. It was private, wasn't it? Entirely yeah. at that time. It was time. entirely now private. It's semi. I guess. Well, I don't know what the finances were, whether the state of New York did not have to pay for each student mm. something. That's the arrangement that, whether that was already force at that time. But uh, in any case, I stayed there only until uh, when we, we started in October, November, December, January, February. In March I was already with the American Foundation for the Blind. Because what I did was I went every afternoon. My position was only a half-time position. And I went to the foundation, to the library, and started reading up again. And of course, I wanted to become more, more better capable of using the English language. And uh, I saw Doctor, uh, I saw Mr. Irwin. He, I knew him from my first visit. Right? So he asked me whether I, he asked me to have lunch with him, and then asked me to drop into his office whenever I come down to the foundation. Uh, I did that a few times, not every time I came to the foundation. And then in November, he gave me a ring and he said that I could come to the foundation. And I said, yes. When? He said, tomorrow. It was Saturday. It was Friday. On Saturday he wanted to see me. I said, I can come. I went down. And he had asked me about, he asked me a, a few weeks before that to write up something for him what I thought could be done with the talking book in the education of blind children. So I thought out some of the things that I think should be done and could be done and wrote it down. And he paid me for it. He said, I'll pay you for it, Lord said. And he paid me $25 for it. So I got the $25 and he got the uh, couple of, of sheets that I wrote. And I didn't hear from him until sometimes in December he asked me to come down to the foundation. And he told me at that time that he got a grant on the basis of what I had written and what he had thought out himself. He said, I, I worked up an application and I got a grant from the Carnegie Corporation. And he offered me a position at the foundation with, to introduce the talking book in the education of blind children. Whether, and uh, he said, now go back and talk it over with Greg or with your wife. I said, I don't have to talk it over with her, I know already. <laughs> I said, it was always my, my, my dream to work with the American Foundation for the Blind. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that uh, he would have to talk with Mr. Miguel, Major Miguel, and uh, Major Miguel would ring me up and make an appointment with me because I have to see him first before he can really finalize things. Because Miguel is the ultimate mm -hmm. in decision making. And he said, well, you, you might have, uh, Irvin told me, you might have a pretty stiff stand there because he's not always well disposed toward others, particularly not towards foreign foreigners. And I knew what he meant. So, uh, someday I got a call from Mr. Miguel and he wanted to see me and they made an appointment for four in the afternoon 
and I went to his home on Fifth Avenue in New York, very elegant, dark furniture, leather furniture in all of And I was seated there, I was there very punctual at four o'clock. And by sorry, four fifteen, four thirty and four forty five no Mr. Miguel. So I waited. And as I recall it I had already as the time grew longer and longer, I became more satisfied that Mr. Miguel will listen very carefully to what I had to say and, but, and would feel guilty about his being late. And when he came, he was very embarrassed and apologized to the right and the left. And Irwin had told me, now, watch out, if he offers you a glass of sherry, you are in. And, he, and Miguel started asking me about a number of things about my past, how I came to the United States, what I did before. He was quite impressed that I was a Rockefeller fellow uh, before and uh, became friendly and friendly and then he said, would you like a glass of sherry? Well, uh, remembering <laughs> what Irving told me, I know I had in a way gained his confidence. And after uh, an hour's discussion, uh, we parted and I left. And Irving called me up the next day, early in the morning. He said, you did it. He, he is all in favor. So I came to the foundation. And I had ten very happy years, I must say. They were happy, <coughs> although, although it, the conditions in Europe were always in the back of my my mind, you know, I always had to think of what happened on, yeah. what happened in Europe and what was Relatives going on. But nevertheless, uh, I was comparatively young and I was more, uh, I was kind of elated that we could escape and uh, that I had another chance to, to work into my field. I'm glad you came. Yeah, I, am, I, <laughs> I certainly am glad. <laughs> what, what was your favorite? Um, study or activity at the foundation? Well, I, I like to work with the, with the talking book because, because it was a new thing. And I had, in a way, I had a lot of ideas about it. I particularly thought that uh, we, could, we could illustrate books for blind children, which in Braille is not possible, uh, or only possible to a very limit, very, very limited extent, if at all. So I thought that we could illustrate it with sound illustrations. And, I, and then when we had done some experimental work on that, on, on dramatizations, I got in touch with the American Printing House for the Blind, because they were the ones who could translate it into action. And while I was concerned with this whole thing for the first two years at the foundation, uh, the printing house became quite uh, open to the idea of using sound effects as illustrations. But uh, as with all these things, unless somebody is there to follow up on it, it, uh, it isn't done. And it was done only while I was with the concerned with the talking book and not when I later on assumed larger responsibilities at the foundation. Was it your involvement in the talking book program that um, that resulted in the foundation being along with the printing house the two major studios for no, recording talking no, books. No, no, that was already pre-established. Oh, it was? Yeah. No, no. the American <coughs> printing house and the foundation were the two talking book producing uh, organizations. What, what I do, did at that time, the American printing house included quite a number of uh, books for children with sound effects and with sound illustrations. But it fell asleep again because nobody at the printing house was really interested in it and I wasn't there to, 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 push, it, uh, to push it into it. Was Marjorie it. Hooper so already at Marjorie the Marjorie Hooper was already at the printing house, <laughs> yes. yes. I knew her already from Wisconsin. Uh, did, uh, did they do any work while you were there with the wire recorders? 
and so forth. No, it's not yet at that time. That nothing was nothing with magnetic tape or anything. At that they, time. they may have done the experiment. Yes, I, I remember they probably did something, but that was not really. It was an experimental right. uh, workshop that they had, in which they tried all kinds of things, and they were quite active in the fact that uh, we used these light uh, shellac recordings. A uh, long time before it became, be before they became commercially available, and at 33 and at RPM, yeah. uh, before it became commercially right. available. Commercially I remember available. you could play them on a on a regular commercial That's turntable. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And but there were no no other turntables available. Right. So, uh, and then I had to do a study. Irving asked me to do a study of teachers of the status of teachers of the blind and their salaries. Hmm. And I did that. It was published by the foundation. And it uh, helped raise the lab level of uh, teachers' salaries because every state could point to this study as, and they made a good deal of use of this study uh, in the 19, early 1940s. Which means to raise that the level of, stand, of, of uh, salary. Teachers in schools for the blind were paid less? Yeah. Even though they were state schools? Oh, yes. yes. That's because you yes. got your reward in heaven. Yes, reward in heaven <laughs> and because... Uh, or hell. <laughs> yeah. you know, which teaching is an idealistic proposition for the other people. Yeah, right. For the people who don't teach. You know, yeah. For the teachers it's bread and butter also. Well, and, you know, the, 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 the work that probably most of us in education know you best for during that 10-year period is preschool blind. Yeah, yeah. I thought that I was always interested in young children from my doctor's dissertation, which was dealing with the development of hearing during the first year of life. I was always interested in, in young, very young children, preschool children. And then when the foundation uh, heard from various parts of the country that there was an increase in blind babies, and uh, when the whole question of what caused this increase, and we knew that it was uh, attacking prematurely born children largely, but didn't know what, what the cause was. And then a whole array of causes were followed up in various universities, in various schools, uh, at hospitals, you know, from, from oxygen in the air to, to uh, light and to carrots and to... Uh, too uh, cold, uh, too hot, too much food, too yeah, little. Yeah, yeah right? too much food, too little food, uh, or right. the wrong food, yeah. uh, and, and all kinds of things. It was a guessing game, and by elimination, yeah. it narrowed down until in England, uh, some uh, ophthalmologists found the actual fact that uh, oxygen, too much oxygen, in the premature in the in the cabinets for premature born children was William cost. Silverman in New York City at that time. Doctor Silverman was he in New York? The fellow that he may have been in New York, but I didn't know. Did he was at Columbia University. Yeah. Medical center in the premature unit. Yeah. In the premature, but I think <coughs> later on, because I was in in uh, I was a teacher's college and I didn't know of him. Did Pauline Moore come to the foundation before you left? No, I don't think so. So they really. But, uh, but George Lee Abert came. Oh, did she? Yeah. So but I would have to, to look that up because I don't really yeah. remember it. I left the foundation in '49. The, the, but there 49. were, my, my recollection of, of my early experiences with the foundation were Annette Dinsmore, Georgia Lee Abel, yes. Polly Moore, yes. Kate Gruber. That was already after I left, oh. after I had left. Because that was the team that was developed by Barnett. 
you wait a moment, I want to get something that I had in my hands only yesterday by chance. I want to show it to you. I'm just going to let that thing run. Sure. Easier to yeah. cut it out. What time do you want to? Well, we probably break? ought to run uh, it. Yeah. yeah. I think that will be enough for him. Yeah. I think that the, the important parts of his life we really looked at the California era is That's pretty well I'll known. Yeah. All I'd like to do is to get that transition from New York to California. From Teachers College in 1948, yeah. November 48. And, and this is a reference letter signed by W.B. Featherstone, Professor of Education and Head of the Department of Special Education. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it verifies that Dr. Berthold Lohenfeld held a post as lecturer since September 1944. So from 44 to 48, 48 yeah. you were on the uh, faculty, and you taught methods, current problems in the welfare and rehabilitation. Was that for rehabilitation teachers? Also, yeah. And psychological aspects. Yeah. And then it concludes by saying Dr. Lohenfeld's services have been eminently satisfactory both to his students and to the university authorities. It is hoped that he may continue indefinitely to participate in the instructional program of this department. And shortly thereafter, you moved to California. I mean, <laughs> yeah. He thought that by writing this letter, he I, I had an incentive to stay. Ah. You see? Yeah. But he wanted me. He, uh, he was very upset about it because he, he didn't have anyone who could immediately take over. Those were the days when most teachers of blind children were taught on a part-time basis in summers and a course at a time. Right. Because in 1948, that was when the program at San Francisco State just began. Yeah. And Mrs. Henderson was hired. Right. That's right. Yeah. That was in 48. So, 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 so when, when this was just before you left for California? Yeah. From 1944 on to 1948, I was on the faculty of Teachers College. Right. Because they didn't have any professorship. There was only one professorship. Mm -hmm. And that was famous. So everyone yeah, was part of time. Lecturers or instructors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody was part time. They didn't have. He, he, he was the only full time, had the Person. only, had the only full time position. I thought that that was an interesting document. Oh, right. yes. <laughs> then then when, uh, when did the call come to California? Or did, well, was this something you pursued or somebody pursued you? No, I tell you how it was. Uh, I had come out, I had come to a convention somewhere in the Middle West, and I don't know exactly where it was whether it was in Oklahoma or in one of these states, a CEC convention. Hmm. And Dr. French was also there. And so naturally we talked together and we spent a good deal of time together. And one evening he said to me, you know, I think I ought to tell you, but I'm planning to retire. And that was in 1947, I think, 47 or 48, and that was in November. It may have been in the spring of 48. And at that time there was a convention in San Francisco of the CEC, and we, 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 we discussed this. And he said that he's planning to retire. 
And I said, oh, I thought you would stay on. And I mean, the usual thing that you say when an old superintendent <laughs> tells you he's planning to retire. And uh, we talked a little about it. And then he said, and uh, you know, I would like to have, I know whom I would like to succeed me. French said. Uh, I said, no, that's interesting. Who, who would you like to succeed, to succeed you? And he said, I would like a, a certain Dr. Lowenfeld. I, I, I didn't really, I didn't think that he would, would have any thought of me because I was pretty well established in New York in, in my position and I was happy there. And I traveled a good deal and I was becoming internationally involved also. And I said, well, to Dr. French, I said, well, I don't think that is in the books because I'm quite satisfied with my job at the foundation. And at that we left. And I went back to Washington and met Gretel in Washington because there was at that time, and I could almost find out of I could almost time it, because there was a, a national health conference in Washington, to which I was asked to, which I was asked to attend, as a, as representing the foundation. And I went directly to that conference in Washington. And in the evening, when Gretel and I sat together, I told her about Dr. French's uh, veiled offer. And Gretel said, "What did you say?" And I said that I said I'm not interested in it because I have my good job at the American Foundation where I like my work. And Cato said, started saying, how can you say something like that in <laughs> California? You know, in California, you know, we always wanted to come to go to California, and and so she started working. On it. And uh, finally. I wrote a letter to Dr. French that after discussing the thing with Gretel uh, and, and thinking it over in greater detail, I would like to uh, be considered for the position. And French wrote me back uh, telling me that he knows that he's glad and so on, and, uh, but he, he has to tell me that it's a civil service position and I have to go through the rigmaroles of the civil service which are considerably. So that that's that's the way it started. You came out and went through the rigmarole. Yes, right? yes. I had to go through the rigmarole to a particularly through a written test that was administered in New York by the by some New York commission uh, that, that supervised me while I was writing by it was a written examination. And then I had an oral interview where Dr. French, Dr. Perry, Newell Perry was on yes. the board and a representative of the personnel board, these three. And they interviewed three superintendents who had applied for the position. I was number one. I was placed number one because my oral, my, my written examination basically as first. And then uh, the two when they the two others when they saw me were rather crestfallen, you know, were rather disappointed because they didn't expect a third one to show up. They had they had already divided the made their own arrangements who would follow whom if <laughs> one of the two was appointed, how they would the the spoils, yes, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and when they saw me, I, they became very, very uh, visibly uh, apprehensive. Well, and Dr. Stoltz was the one with whom I negotiated all the time, and he wanted me. I had met him and uh, Lois Stoltz, and he was very, uh, he was convinced that I'm the only person whom he would like to have in position. So I he, he had the same position that later on Francis Doyle had? Who? 
Dr. Stokes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Director he, of Special Education. He was Director State. of Special Education and Deputy Superintendent of Instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doyle, Doyle, Doyle followed him. Yeah. There was a Mr. Doyle also. Oh, was there? Yeah. But Frank Doyle followed him in the position. And uh, Herbert wanted me, and uh, finally I came up. So, but I, I thought we would talk about less personal things. <laughs> you, you told me. More personal be, things? Yeah, no, less personal. Oh. About less personal. But I, but I think it's about been kind of, you know, of how one thing affects another. You know, yeah. how writing well, or doing we, something for We could talk about what great martinis you make. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready for one? <laughs> Maybe? Well, do you think we ought yeah. to wrap this up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So far as I'm right. concerned, yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you very yeah. much for letting us come in. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. And I will not appoint, disappoint you, Phil. How about you? Right. What do you like? I would like anything without any sugar or, uh, you know, no alcohol. So no alcohol. Yeah. No. Um, seven up. If you had... You no had, you no had, sugar. All right, no sugar. Uh, I'll take diet, it. Yeah. diet seven yeah, up. Very much, yes. Thank you.